Hey, this is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie, and I'm so excited about today's show. I want to play you the short clip with my guest, uh, kind of from the middle of the interview. Um, check it out. I'm not even going to tell you who it is. I just want you to listen. My concern is that I feel like socialists are taking over. They're marching through the institutions. They're taking everything over They and uh, taking over education. It looks like they've taken over a lot of the corporations. It looks like they've taken over um, the military, and, and it's just continuing. Yeah. I'm, so I'm, I'm deeply concerned about, um, um, you know, I'm a capitalist at heart, and I'm a li- I believe in liberty and capitalism. Those are my, my twin values. And I feel like, you know, with the way freedom of speech is today, uh, the movement on, on gun control, um, a lot of the th- liberties that I've taken for granted most of my life, I think are under threat. So that's John Mackey, the co-founder and retiring CEO of Whole Foods, the grocery store that forever changed not only how we shop for food, but how we think about supermarkets. If you are as old as me, and I'm pretty old, I, I turned 19, uh, I was born in 1963. I just turned uh, 59 years old. But if you're as old as me, you remember how dreary food shopping was, you know, most of the time before Whole Foods exploded the concept, right? And the, and the, and the, the shopping space, the supermarket space, you'd walk down the produce aisle and there'd be two or three types of potatoes, uh, maybe one kind of eggplant, you know, the dark black, blue, purple eggplant, if you were lucky, it's kind of an ethnic food, uh, you know, right? What, you know, what's that doing? Uh, a green pepper, a sad little jalapeno or something. You know, there was nothing like the overflowing bounty that, uh, you know, you see everywhere today. Even in big cities, I can tell you, you know, you had to roam around all over town to find oddball spices that are everywhere now that you can buy at 7-Eleven or gas stations, for God's sake. You know, since it got going in 1978, Whole Foods has forced every Kroger, Safeway, ShopRite, Food Town, H-E-B Pantry, which is a great chain based in Texas, uh, but and even Walmart Supercenters to up their games when it came to the variety of what they sell and how they sell it and at what prices and all of that kind of stuff. So John is retiring at the end of the month. He was born in 1953, is in his late 60s, and his retirement is a bittersweet moment, uh, not just for him. But for Whole Foods uh, and and all of its customers, I feel that way. Over the course of his career, John developed and evangelized for what he calls conscious capitalism or businesses that seek to create. And I'm reading from its credo. Uh, There's a website that's also in the show page links. But conscious capitalism uh, works to create businesses that seek to uh, create financial, intellectual, social, cultural, emotional, spiritual, physical and ecological wealth for all of their stakeholders. And you might be thinking, oh, you know, what is this hippie stuff going on? What's this hippie crap about stakeholders and spiritual wealth? No, it's capital wealth. It's it's stock returns, right? But John is one of the hardest core, if not the hardest core capitalists that I've ever met. But he's also an incredibly spiritual and thoughtful guy who wants to help all of us live better, more interesting lives. I've known him for, it's got to be 20 years now. And I've talked with him many times over the years for Reason. Uh, there will be links in the homepage at reason.com slash podcast, uh, you know, for this episode and, um, you know, to our past interviews and also to his epic 2005 debate with Nobel laureate Milton Friedman, one of his heroes and former Cypress Semiconductor CEO T.J. Rogers about rethinking the social responsibility of business. For a really long time, it was always one of the highest trafficked pages on our our website for years after uh, we posted it in 2005. Um, And for good reason, because he is speaking to where we are in a world that is past the Industrial Revolution, that is past subsistence farming, and that is rich enough so that we can start bumping our snouts further and further up Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs and start figuring out how we can flourish rather than just subsist. I caught up with John at Freedom Fest, the annual gathering in Las Vegas. Uh, He was coming off the stage. He had just participated in a debate about Bitcoin and crypto. Uh, Short version, uh, he's not against them in in principle, but he thinks there's a lot of scams going on in the current market. But 
mostly what we talked about was his time at Whole Foods and what it was like saying goodbye to the company that he had created into this international behemoth that has changed the way that we think about how we do business, um, how his company did an exceptional job of staying open and serving people during COVID, how he thought the government responded to things, both by regulating businesses in all sorts of ways. He also is skeptical of the vaccines that have come out, certainly of the mandates. We disagree a little bit about that for sure. Um, but we talk about all of that and more, including that creeping socialism that he's worried about. That was in the clip that I played just a couple of seconds ago or a couple of minutes ago. And we, of course, talked about what he's going to be doing now that he's retiring. And the good news on that front is that uh, John told me that he's been muzzled or he's felt muzzled by his position as CEO of Whole Foods, that in that role, you know, he's got a fiduciary responsibility and he can't really speak his mind on a wide variety of issues, um, you know, because he's got to take care of shareholders, stockholders, stakeholders, you name it. But he's and he told me at Freedom Fest that he's going to be spending part of his time post Whole Foods working on some health and wellness startups. We talk a little bit about that, but um, he's going to be spending a lot of his time talking about what he sees as a society that is trying to control and regulate the life out of us all, you know, from there's right wing versions of that and left wing versions. And he is going to be speaking out unmuzzled against that. So without further ado, here is the reason interview with John Mackey. Uh, let me ask you this, you know, the, the COVID era has been like a clarifying moment, right? right. Um, and one of the things that I got to tell you, and I feel like I'm almost special pleading, but I live a couple blocks from the Houston Street Whole Foods in Manhattan. And, you know, when the lockdown was happening in Manhattan, I went to Whole Foods to get a bunch of stuff. And it was amazing. Like the, the shells were clearing out immediately. This was in March of 2020. But, you know, the next day people were working there. The shelves were filling up as quickly as they could. Talk about Whole Foods' response and, like, how did Whole Foods and some other grocery store chains did this, too? I mean, a lot of them, we were told, you know, there was going to be massive disruption, that all sorts of things. How did you keep it together to keep your, your workers healthy and showing up and food on the shelves? Well, it, there was massive disruptions, and uh, it was a very difficult, very difficult time. Uh, the lockdowns. I believe history will show that that was probably the stupidest thing that the government will have done will have done in the 21st century. If, unless they get into a nuclear war, it, it was idiotic. And even that will be able to shop freely, right? Well, I mean, the so-called vaccinations didn't really prevent COVID. I mean, which is what you expect a vaccination to do. And uh, there have been lots of side effects for people. And my wife is a long hauler now from the booster of all things so and the places that locked down like new zealand and australia now they're uh, now they have epidemic uh, infection rates so you're so, so you're the, not sold on the MNR, mrna I'm, I'm, vaccines no yeah. i mean it was experimental and mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't deliver as was promised i thought we were getting you know when i get a polio vaccination i expect i'm never going to get polio right. not that in six months i got to get a polio booster do you and even if i got it i'd I got both vaccinations and I still got COVID. Like sure. almost everybody I know, I still got COVID. Right. But, and you don't believe that you got a lesser version of it than you might have had otherwise, that the, uh, the efficacy of the vaccines is not in preventing the disease, but lo lessening the effects of it. I mean, I have lots of friends that didn't get vaccinations and they didn't get seriously ill as well. It seemed to be, statistically now, it seems to be a disease. I mean, you know, 80% of the deaths in the United States were to, were to people that are obese. Right. And most of them are, you know, over 70 years of age. So it, it was selective in its killing. It's just the media didn't really report on it. And, and it, anybody that gave a counter narrative was sort of canceled out or they weren't allowed to. So talk about out there. How, but how, how did Whole Foods respond? Yeah. So it was very difficult for us. We were an essential business, so we were able to be open for business. It was very hard on the morale of the company. Our team members were scared. Right, they're being exposed probably to COVID, yeah. and they didn't. In, back, in, in the early days, we didn't know what to expect. Was that a death sentence? It was amazing COVID? too that for all the discussion of okay, uh, essential workers or front frontline workers, there was not a lot of empathy for grocery workers 
in a way. You I'm know, not that, sure what you mean by empathy. Uh, what I mean is that there was a lot of discussion of teachers. There were a lot of discussions of people who worked in hospitals and what they were putting up with. But people who were in uh, well, the grocery te- the stores. Teacher, the teachers, they, they started, they were all online. Yeah. No, that, what I'm saying is it's amazing to me that, there, you know, the people who showed up every day were the people who were working in, in markets, supermarkets, and, and drugstores. Well, we, we paid, we raised the pay of everybody. And, uh, uh, but still, it was very hard because people were scared. They didn't know what to expect. Um, there were no vaccinations available. Even if they didn't work, at least they, you know, with a placebo effect, at least for many people. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have that. And people were scared. Anytime anybody came down with COVID, they, you know, there was a 14-day quarantine. Anybody that they were, um, any of our team members they might have been around were also quarantined. So we had a lot of trouble keeping, our, keeping the staff going because a lot of times some stores would be. I remember going into one of our, our, our um, the downtown Austin store where I officed and shopped one time. And we, no, we had no cashiers available. Everybody was forced to go to self checkout. Fortunately, we had self checkout because there were no. Everybody was quarantined, so it was very difficult. And then also the social distancing. Our, our Whole Foods culture is very um, touchy feely, a huggy culture, and everybody's social distancing. It's like the guy next to you might have the plague, and so nobody's touching. People aren't. They're you isolating guys also at home. Ha- you have like incredibly high traffic stores too, right? I mean, it's yes, yeah. So, but, the, but you know, I, uh, what happened, of course, is that Amazon helped us scale up our delivery quicker, and that we would have been able to do on our own. And at our peak, twenty eight percent of our sales were coming from delivery. Wow. So, um, is that uh, you know on a certain level? And what was it before that? What was average? two, two or three percent? So it's a massive increase, but it still seems kind of low, right? Because it seemed like everybody was getting everything delivered. Well, m- most people weren't getting delivered. There also were pickup. And, uh, but then there was, you know, people just coming in, lining up. But the difference is, is they would it'd have a list and they would race through the store to get the hell out of there because yeah. they were so scared. They had to get food, but they didn't, you know, no samplings going on. Our prepared foods business crashed. We, yeah. In fact, they wouldn't let us, our salad bars, our hot bars, anything. Back in the day, remember, we, before we realized that, that COVID was an airborne disease, we had contaminated. People worried that, you know, you could pick it up off of uh, yeah, somebody, surface, surface yeah. infections. And that, that proved not to be true. But the fear was there. So all of our, our prepared food sales dropped down 80, 80 percent. Uh, hot bars, salad bars. All that self-service stuff was eliminated. What is the what's the morale like now? Because it seems like you know we uh, people know kind of what we're dealing. It's with. a great question. The, I just, you know I am retiring from Whole Foods in just six weeks now. Oh wow! And I leave September first, forty-four years. Wow! And uh, um, but I've been on a grand tour to say goodbye. Went to all ten of our regions. Oh, been incredible. in over hundred stores in the last couple of months. Yeah. Saying goodbye. Morale is very high. It's very high right now. Very high. Is that because you're leaving? I think that might be the case. <laughs> they sure were cheering a lot for me. So, <laughs> on the way out, not yeah. when they saw you. Yeah, but I, th- um, I think. Yeah, I think, why is that though? That's. I, I, I think, mean, that's great to hear. What, I think because it's things have normalized, hmm. meaning people are not having to wear masks. They are they're able to hug and touch again. They've they've re- team meetings have come back. Uh, life is normalizing again for yeah. most people, and so they 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 suffered through a couple of years of of. You know, not really having any co- connection with their friends, right? Not going out to a bar and having a beer after work and, and hanging out. Now the, we've gotten through it yeah. and they've survived. I think it's kind of like the joy of surviving like a near-death experience. Right. Life is precious and you realize that you still got it. Um, how did, you know, the, the merger with Amazon is interest i mean like ultimately it turned out to be pretty opportune for certainly for your customers um how did you know how did that work or did it did it accelerate changes in the way whole foods operates or the way amazon operates the good thing is amazon did not try to really change whole foods culture mm-hmm. it didn't try to make us into amazon a clone mm-hmm. um it, they didn't understand our culture so that was, uh, sometimes we had difficult communication challenges there, um, but they were respectful of the culture. Um, they helped us in technology. I mean, 
I mean, it's taken a while, but we have our first couple of uh, just walk out stores uh, up and running now. But a lot of people are, are scared of that technology. They've also got grocery carts that can scan as you go in the grocery cart. And we're now introducing those into our stores. And of course, they accelerated our delivery. They were able to scale up quicker than we could have done. So they've helped us with technology. How about, uh, you know, not necessarily Amazon, but, you know, one of the things that is incredible about Whole Foods, and I always used to think about this, you know, 25 years ago, of how Whole Foods is the embodiment of global free trade. And, uh, you know, because so much of your stuff is coming, it's sourced from all over the world. Is that coming back to normal or how stressed was that? Supply chains, you, you, what, you, what you read about and what you've probably written about is COVID has messed up su supply chains around the world. I mean, so much stuff's manufactured in China. Those relationships have been, have been definitely disrupted. Uh, energy is a problem. But mainly, like all types of, you know, we, we're still opening 20 to 30 stores a year. And we've had to delay store after store after store, but you just can't get buildings. We can't get the stuff we need. Um, different things go scarce. So s supply chains will normalize again because that's the way capitalism works. Mm -hmm. But right now, um, that's driving up the cost of con new construction tremendously. There have been tight labor. As you know, labor's been tight. We're, there's not a store in our company that we're not down several people. Yeah. Um, have you, did you find the, uh, and I, I'm not sure how this would have worked in a Whole Foods context, but the expansion of federal unemployment benefits in most states increased the amount they gave and, ex and extended the version. Did that have an impact on your workers? It had, a, it had an impact on our ability to hire. A lot of people occurred, were making as much money or more money not working at all. Right. And so guess what? They chose not to work. Yeah. And it's been, they've been reluctant to come back to work. It's sort of, um, they got used to it. Do you think that is also, I mean, fitting into a kind of generational shift? You're, you're a baby boomer, I'm a baby boomer. And I'm, I don't, you know, there, hell, there's a lot that's wrong with the baby boom, but things are different now. And they are different. I, I've become, I remember I constantly was telling my father, I said, Dad, you just don't understand our generation. And I feel like I've become my father. I don't understand the younger generation. They, they don't seem to want to work. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think you know, that, is I that? couldn't? I, I couldn't wait to work. Yeah. Work, work for me. I started working as soon as I was able to because that's how I could get money to spend things yeah, I, I mean, wanted. Do you think it's they don't want to work because they don't have to? Whether it's their parents or government kind of feathering the nest. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, Maybe they don't only want to work if it works really purposeful and right. you feel aligned well, to Well, I would think at Whole Foods that that's kind of a place where it's a purposeful workplace more than, you know, I, maybe, I mean, my first 10 years of jobs weren't, I wasn't because I loved the work, right? I needed the money. Well, um, that may be so. We may be having fewer problems than Starbucks is having. I don't know for sure. Yeah. But I know that we're, we're really straining to get people hired, particularly in the cities like uh, New York, the big ones, New York, L.A., Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, well, D.C. Can I, can I ask you, is that, because uh, I want to talk about conscious capitalism, which is, you know, one of the things that you've been pushing, that we've reached a different stage of societal development. We're post-industrial revolution. Work should be more meaningful. Our activity is more symbolic and, and imbued with deep commitments or, or reflections of our deep commitments, is that part of the, you know, what some people call the great resignation or whatever, that younger people aren't as quick to work because they want meaningful work? It may be, uh, but you can't expect to start with meaningful work. I mean, you're yeah. going to have to earn it. I'm, I'm hoping to end time. with meaningful work. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, I think you're doing meaningful work ever since you joined Reason, right? You're aligned with your yeah. values with that. Uh, absolutely. Unless you want to yeah. go on the record saying it's no, not No, no. <laughs> no, I mean, but it, it takes a while to get there, and I enjoyed yes. my work you like were, you You did. had to pay a price to get yeah. where you are. Yeah. I, some of the younger generation doesn't seem to be willing to pay that price, and I don't know why. I don't know whether it's their parents or, I mean... Well, I you're could, a student of Schumpeter, yeah. and I mean, are we in that stage of capitalism where it kind of starts to eat itself because we've forgotten that wealth is not a given, wealth is let a, me tell you a something. rare thing? So, th yes, that may be true, but let me make a counter-narrative, uh, which is, as i just done this tour, and I've been in 100 Whole Foods Market stores in the last two or three months, and 
because it's my last time I was touring, they knew the last time I was going to be in their store as a CEO. And it's incredibly touching. It is. You talk and about. a lot of people will come up and tell me their stories. They, they wanted to know how much they loved Whole Foods and they wanted me to tell them the story. And of course, Whole Foods has a massive amount of first generation immigrants working in our stores. And so many of them came up and they were crying and they told, like this one woman in one of our DC stores, she, she came up and said, you need to hear my story. I joined this company 23 years ago, right after I immigrated to the United States. I had three very small children. I went to work here. I've been promoted six times. My third child just graduated from college. I own a house and I own a rental property too. Yeah. And she was crying when she was telling me all this. I owe Whole Foods everything. The American dream is still alive. Yeah. And immigrants are still flocking over here and they can move up and they're, her, she's so proud of her children. They went through college. She put yeah. them through. I, um, and she, she feels like Whole Foods gave her that opportunity. Hey, before we continue the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie, I want to introduce you to today's sponsor. It is a company called EverydayDose.com. If you're like most people, like I used to be, you start your day with a cup of coffee. But, you know, your favorite habit is probably causing some serious negative side effects for your health, your energy, and your mood. So I want you to think about starting your morning the way I do, with a great beverage called Everyday Dose. It is great tasting, affordable, and it makes my morning something that I look forward to. But before I sell you on the particulars of Everyday Dose, I want to give you facts that will make you pour your coffee down the drain before you even sip it. Just throw it out already, okay? Because normal coffee has a bunch of problems with it. First off, it's highly acidic, which is why it gives you stomach aches sometimes. It weakens the lining of digestive systems and it messes with your microbiome over time. And that can lead to uncomfortable or embarrassing gut issues in the short term, but much more serious conditions over the long haul. Normal coffee increases stress hormones in the body and it causes adrenal fatigue over time. That's why people get caffeine jitters, why they have trouble sleeping at night. They wake up tired. They get brain fog in the middle of the day. Coffee can even cause weight gain. Drinking lots of traditional coffee also makes you anxious or irritable. You know this, right? because it triggers your body's fight or flight response. So that's the case against coffee. The case for everyday dose, it combines adaptogenic mushrooms, nootropics, and collagen with organic low acidity cold brew coffee extract that actually will increase your energy, heal your gut, and boost your mood. And like I said, I've been, I've been drinking this stuff every morning for over a year. The best part of it it tastes like coffee, so I still get that morning ritual. I love making coffee and letting it cool and adding cream or whatever I want in it, oat milk, you, whatever. Uh, but it's a great ritual. And then it also boosts my energy, helps my focus, strengthens immunity, enhances my mood, improves my quality of sleep, restores my gut health. What makes Everyday Dose really unique is that it's made from real USDA organic mushrooms. These are 100% fruiting body double extracted for increased bioavailability, which is a really fancy way of saying that you absorb everything easily. Your body absorbs everything easily that's in the mushrooms. There's no fillers in this stuff. It's the only mushroom coffee on the market that includes collagen and L-theanine, which really help it be better. And uh, because it's got low acidity cold brew coffee extract in it, at a small dose, it gives you the optimal amount of caffeine, just 39 milligrams per serving without upsetting your stomach. And I think I mentioned this, it tastes just like a delicious cup of light cold brew coffee. Doesn't taste like mushrooms. You would have no idea that mushrooms are involved in this. It is like coffee, except it's better than coffee. So try Everyday Dose, a delicious, better-for-you coffee without the jitters, without the crash or digestive issues of traditional coffee. You can try it absolutely risk-free with a 60-day money-back guarantee. I don't think you're going to want the money back. I think you're going to want more Everyday Dose. Go to EverydayDose.com, all one word, EverydayDose.com today and get some Everyday Dose. You're going to love it. And now, back to the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie. 
Do you feel like, and it's not like, you know, you know, you, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade or something, but like in terms of conscious capitalism and the idea of, you know, talking about capitalism in a way where it is, you know, it is about self-actualization both on the individual and at the community level, is this an opportunity, uh, you know, what happened during COVID and, you know, the pause in economic activity, is this, you know, can you you know, can you use that to your advantage in order to sell a vision of a kind of post-industrial capitalism? Yeah. Nick, what worries me right now is that, I mean, conscious capitalism is a management philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's a way you should manage your business. You should figure out what the higher purpose of your business is. Um, and that's always going to be in value creation for other people. Yeah. It's about whatever it is. You're creating some value for other people or you wouldn't have a business in the right. first place. Um, Whole Foods' is higher purpose is to nourish people in the planet. So, um, uh, secondly, it's about the stakeholders, that they all matter and they're interdependent. Um, and then it's about creating, you know, um, leadership that's, that's more awake, more conscious, and then cultures that where people flourish. That's the four pillars of conscious capitalism. But I'm very concerned that people are, uh, that it's being co-opted, that, uh, it's, it's a management philosophy, it's not a governance system. So ESG, and I'm oftentimes being having to defend conscious capitalism, which is being conflated with ESG thinking, which is basically a political philosophy that's trying to force corporations to adhere to their particular political philosophies and taking away power from the shareholders. It's yeah. really what it's about. Uh, we're gonna make those corporations and we're gonna put diversity on the board and we're gonna have the, the, the team members need to be, the employees need to be represented, and the the. Um, but and the outcomes have to be a certain way, yes, right? Exactly. It's not and simply that they're on the board or they're right. represented, but it that's ends right. up looking this and way. And so that's not what conscious capitalism. Conscious capitalism is a philosophy, a way to think about your business yeah. that is just a little bit more enlightened, mm -hmm. a little more. Um, and I think it's going to be a more successful way to manage your business as well. It's not about distorting the governance system to. to to take away the power from the investors. That will screw up capitalism. And maybe I think that's the intention all along. Do, um, uh, you, know, do you think uh, kind of the experience with COVID and an economy that has been you know, extremely volatile for almost all of the 21st century, and you know, the leftist Marxists will say, this is the, the end game of capitalism. Chapter, yeah, which they've been saying for the last. Of course, years. Yeah, but then again, you know, libertarians have been saying, you know, inflation's coming, and you know, and it, it it finally arrives. But do you think the the experience with COVID after the financial crisis, after you know all sorts of uh, you know issues, is that going to speed up risk taking and innovation, or is it going to make people kind of more fearful, both in terms of starting companies or the way that they try out new things? It's a good question. Um, I don't know really the answer to it. Um, I see different I, I see different statistics uh, that show in some ways we're more innovative than we've ever been, and others that say that innovation is slowing down to a crawl right. due to regulations. I guess what what's different? It's a lot easier to get capital now. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're an entrepreneur, it's so much easier to get capital yeah. than it was when I was starting out. They didn't even have venture capitalists really when I was starting out. Right. That was a new thing coming up in in Silicon Valley. Uh, money's easier. But uh, there are other problems. Labor is more difficult. Uh, the type of regulations that make, and so many people just sell out now because to go public with uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, the burden of, the financial burden on small companies makes it difficult to go, to go public, frankly. So a lot don't, they just sell out. Uh, or now they get the, what's the, um, what's the new form they do um, where you get a, uh, a, a what is it, a SPAT, SPEC, SPEC, SPAT, SPEC, uh, I forget what it's called. Uh, but it's uh, uh, companies that basically are already public, they don't own anything, mm -hmm. but they're already public, so they will acquire a business wanting to go public. Yeah. And, and that's how the company goes public. Right. So that's a way to get a, uh, yeah. a, a, and that's just kind a specialized of a, vehicle of something or another. Yeah, and it's, it's like a dead weight loss, or it, I mean, yeah. it's a way around regulations. So, so in a, yes, exactly. Yeah. So. The interesting thing about capitalism is um, it's, as, as long as it can innovate, it will. And if you, it's a little bit like, it's like a river flowing. If you throw a rock in there, it, it, the water moves around the rock and it just keeps flowing. Yeah. If you throw enough rocks in it, you can dam it up. Right. 
even then it might break the dam down or it still might r route around it when you get a flood. But using that metaphor, there are a lot of rocks in the water, but innovation is still happening, yeah. but it's maybe not as, so I think it's maybe a little more difficult regulatory wise today than it was. Um, real estate is so much harder to open. For example, um, it's so much harder to get permitting uh, in places like LA, San Francisco, to just get permission from the government to actually build anything. It used to be, they'd make you jump through a few hurdles, but the overall thing was, sure, yeah, do your business. Now, there's, it's, it's all politicized, Nick. If, if, if you're not unionized, maybe you don't get the permit. Uh, and you, they, they can always stop you by putting in, uh, or they, calling for study after study after study after study. How's the traffic study? What's this gonna do to employment? What's this gonna do to housing? I mean, it's endless. So when, when they, for political reasons, governments in locally now are really making it more difficult for business. And a lot of small business people can't deal with it. Either. Do you feel in the, the broad libertarian movement, do you feel like libertarian ideas and sensibilities, are they ascending? Are they declining? Are they, is it kind of always a steady state of it going well some places? No, I think I remember reading an article by you about this very mm -hmm. question okay. and kind of doing the I think I write it almost on a yeah. monthly basis. Well, it's because um, there are so many ways where we're freer than we used to be, like when we were, when you and I were children, for example. Yep. And then there are other ways where we're less free. Right. So, um, so on balance, on balance, do you feel on balance. Here's the thing: it's kind of like you know they say that um, when somebody praises you or somebody puts you down, um, it takes 10, 10 compliments to make up for it. Yeah. I think every regulation that gets in our way, it takes about ten other regulations that are that are you know not there right. that are removed to make us feel like we're making progress yeah. i think overall we're making still making progress but in terms of total numbers um but the ones that they keep taking the ones they take away from us are painful and uh, uh it's, it's so it's an interesting question and i i uh i think financially we're a lot more regulated than we used to be here's the thing it's tricky because I mean, most regulations come in after there's some kind of market failure or some, usually not a market failure, bad actors. Right. And so then they punish everybody in the sector to stop that yeah, I mean, this is Sarbanes-Oxley came yeah. in after the, the tech bubble. Exactly. You know, and then Dodd-Frank came in after the financial That's crisis. That's exactly right. Yeah. And regulations don't, like rocks that have been thrown in the river, they don't tend to get taken away. Right. Yeah. But they did back in the big deregulatory days of like when Reagan was in there and that continued for a while. Thatcher did a lot. Maybe we'll have to have another wave of deregulation that may need to occur as the economy begins to calcify a little How bit. How do you feel about the, you know, I mean, you, you're, you have to deal with politics, even though like your life's work is in markets and like building value and you're trying to like pay off or keep politics out of it. Um, you were critical of Trump, but you were also not hysterical about him. You were, you know, he was not as bad as the alternative. That's exactly right. So, you know, it's interesting, Nick. You're going to like this because in six weeks, I will retire from Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And I have muzzled myself for the la ever since 2009. I wrote that Wall Street Journal op-ed that created this bad, huge yeah, about controversy Obamacare. About, about Obamacare. Yeah. And my board... And, and if I may, just to recap it, about how your the plan that you had in place was better than what was going to come in, but it, you, like life was being made extremely difficult for I just thought we it. needed to innovate yeah. in healthcare and not one size fits all, right. which is what Obamacare is yeah. really about. And we have the same number or slightly higher on uninsured people. Exactly. Yeah. So, but that created a huge yeah. controversy and my board basically shut me down and said, I, they, it's like a father, they started attacking the child and, mm -hmm. the, and I was intimidated enough to shut up. Yeah. But um, you know, I hear the story, you know, Bernie Marcus was one of the founders of, of Home Depot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's pretty conservative, libertarian guy. He started the Job Creators Network. And so Bernie's pretty outspoken. And I, and I read an article one time that people were constantly going after Home Depot to get them to shut up Bernie Marcus. And Home Depot has to say, Bernie retired over 20 years ago. We can't shut him up. You gotta take it to Bernie. Well, I was telling my leadership team, pretty soon you're gonna be hearing about Crazy John, who's no longer muzzled, and you're going to have to say, we can't stop John from talking any longer. What are the, give us a preview 
Uh, well, I got six weeks. Okay. Well, you know what? We can just, hold this I can, until I can you know talk, we can embargo it. I can talk more about politics. Yeah. Uh, and in six weeks than I can today. What is uh, just broadly? What is your concern? Is it that everything is more politicized in, in terms My of... My concern is that I feel like socialists are taking over. They're, they're marching through the institutions. They're taking everything over they, and uh, taking over education. It, it looks like they've taken over cor- a lot of the corporations. It looks like they've taken over um, the military. And, and it's just continuing. Yeah. I'm, so I'm, I'm deeply concerned about... Um, um, you know, I'm a capitalist at heart, and I'm a li- I believe in liberty and capitalism. Those are my yep. my twin values, and I feel like, you know, with the way freedom of speech is today, uh, the movement on on gun control, um, a lot of the liberties that I've taken for granted most of my life, I think, are under threat. Yeah, packing a court maybe, packing the Supreme Court because they uh, vote they're voting down things that. Uh, how does, it, how does it feel to be in Texas? I mean, you're in Austin, so that's one of the coolest cities in America, but it's also, it's in a state that is increasingly conservative. Um, does that, you know, or do you have concerns about Texas as a place to live for freedom? I don't, I like living in Texas. Texans are friendly. I, I don't pay any uh, state income taxes. Um, you know, abortion laws are gonna be democratized now. And people are all in panic, but that's because democracy hasn't yet gone to work yet. So if Texas has too narrow, uh, uh, you know, if it's only five weeks or whatever, yeah. well, there'll be candidates that run on, you know, first trimester, trimester, right. and 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 d- democracy will change the way the abortion laws are, and they'll be more reflective of the overall state values. Um, so I'm I'm just going to be very interesting to see how that particular one plays out. Yeah. Um, and people can will go to different states, or uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I've re- been reading the Reason articles on that, and, and uh, uh, I don't agree with a lot of what I've read in Reason about on the abortion issue, which is Do you that, mean it being restrictive, or uh, no, Reason is uh, seems to be pretty pro uh, Roe versus Wade, and I always thought that was bad constitutional law, mm-hmm. um, and you know, uh, yeah, I, I will cop to being one of the people who I. I tend to think of abortion as a fundamental right, so that yeah. it, and you know, Roe versus Wade gave a place where the state did have an interest. After I believe a it's point. a fundamental right, up to a point, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, would yeah. you say it was a fundamental right up to the day before birth? No. I mean, you know, it's actually in the in the common law Roe and then Planned Parenthood. It's like up to, you know, the second trimester or viability or whatever. So. The, the polls I show seem to say that right now Roe versus Ray, Wade was within any time before birth, right? right. So polls show that about 90% of the population uh, opposes that yeah. yep. up to birth. Right, right. But then about a huge percentage are in favor of abortion in the first trimester. Right, yeah, or the first 15 weeks. Where, I, where I stand yep. on it is kind of women's right to choose until we have a viable fetus mm-hmm. that it can live right then at some point it yeah. becomes murder right. but it's not in the first trimester right. because that's and not it's a viable one of the things i've been stressing it's if, since roe v wade ab- only about 20 percent, 19 20 percent of americans are against abortion under all circumstances it's been remarkably constant and what you know it'll be interesting as you were saying to see some states are going to become more extreme in one direction and in the other the, the point is this is the perfect example of something that democracy should decide not not the supreme court they acted as legislators i think they yeah, were they were I, I don't feel, but if it's a fundamental right up to a certain point like it should be a fundamental right everywhere perhaps is, but that's not what the here's, supreme a, court here's a couple of two old men talking about abortion <laughs> who's, so who's they, never ha- who's never going to be pregnant <laughs> i yeah well you know i have some hope for technological innovation yeah, but what it, what so what are you going to be doing when you retire obviously you're going to be you're going to be embarrassing your the corporation you spent 44 years building uh, by being very political. But what, what kinds of activities are you going to be doing? I and mean, is your ask, conscious capitalism group, what kind of activities? So three, three things. Um, first, I'm working on another book. Um, this will be the whole story, the story of Whole Foods. Uh, it's going to be my most important book. It is going to be narrative, not didactic. 
it's going to be entertaining and funny because there's so many great stories. So this is the full memoir. Yes, of, full memoir. Yeah. Part about me, mostly about Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so many stories that are not known, even within our own company, because, yeah. you know, they were suppressed. Like, right. all because you don't want Business Insider getting into your business all the time. So that stuff's going to come out. It's going to be entertaining. Um, secondly, I'm, I'm going to do a lot more backpacking. I've got a trip planned, uh, a hiking trip planned in Europe, starting in Austria, 488 miles. I start August 18th, come back like October 3rd. Um, thirdly, I'm co-founding another business with some friends. It's going to be, uh, it's called Love Life, with an exclamation mark. And it's, it's, it's not ready for prime time yet, but it's going to be... Kind of a combination of healthy restaurants, uh, wellness center, gym, spa, mm -hmm. and lifestyle medicine. So hope to do. We're going to create a whole chain of those. Uh, let me, uh, as we uh, end this, but um, give the short version. You know, one of the things you've uh, been influential on through Whole Foods, but also through your writing, is a vegan diet. Right. Uh, and you were way ahead of the curve, being anti kind of seed oil and right. things like that. You know, tell me how you're vindicated by everything around us. Well, I'm very passionate about this, and this is my, my new business is going to be doing this directly. Um, Nick, I'm very, I'm very discouraged. I mean, 74% of, of adult Americans are overweight, and 42.5% are obese. And those trend lines got the average adult American gained 27 pounds during COVID because mm -hmm. people were just locked in. And so it's I like guess, a reverse Venezuela. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Reverse Venezuela. Uh, it's funny. I like that. 80% um, of what we spend on healthcare dollars in America are dietary lifestyle diseases. Doctor, we know how to reverse heart. We know how to prevent and reverse heart disease. And yet, what do doctors do? They, they don't tell them. They don't know. Uh, they, they give them a stent and then they put them on cholesterol medicine, statins, uh, try to give them blood pressure medicine to keep their blood pressure down. They're just giving them drugs. They're not curing anything. And yet we know how to cure it. We know how to cure type 2 diabetes. We know how to cure obesity. And yet we're not doing it. And th you could argue there's not any money in it. Um, it's a lot more money. A lot more money made selling drugs to people no. who actually don't really. But I guess well. you're going to be trying to make money by yes. offering an alternative. Yes, so. but it's 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 difficult challenge to get people to change the way they eat and live. So uh, time will tell whether we can make money doing it or not. But um, I've made a fair chunk of money in my life, more than I need, uh, and uh, investing it in this new enterprise. I feel I couldn't not I couldn't go to my grave not doing that. I'm not the kind of man who can just go lie on a beach and uh, enjoy myself yeah. all the time. I'd like to do that for vacations, but I'm, I'm very purposeful. I need to be doing something to, yeah, I'm very purpose driven. Well, you know, thank you for talking. It's good to catch up with you. And also, I mean, thank you for Whole Foods. I remember the first time I got to introduce you at a Reason event, I talked about how, you know, Whole Foods to me is a cathedral of commerce and it, you know, you revolutionize not just the stores you built, but the way food is thought about and is delivered. And it's like, it's a more interesting world because of the way you lined your produce shelves and everything else. So I Thank you. I do think Whole Foods that. has had a positive effect. Yeah. I hope Love Life will have even a bigger effect yeah. over time. Mm -hmm. And hey, Nick, the best thing is I get to be more activist as a libertarian. Yeah. And that's, that's, been, right. that's been suppressed. And I am going to be more activist. You're going to see me a lot more visible. Well, thank you, John Mackey. Thanks, Nick. This has been The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. If you liked what you heard, and I hope you did, please go right now to Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe. Or do this, make it easy on yourself, and just go to reason.com slash podcast and sign up there. And not just for The Reason Interview, but for our other three podcasts. They include... The Reason Roundtable, a weekly podcast that drops every Monday afternoon with me, Catherine Manga Ward, Peter Suderman, and Matt Welch hashing out the biggest issues of the day. Great way to start the week. Then there is the Soho Forum Debates, which is a recording of a live monthly Oxford-style debate that Reason sponsors in New York City every month over issues of particular interest to libertarians. And then finally, there's The Reason Rundown, which is a relatively new weekly podcast that drops every Friday, during which Peter Suderman 
talks to a single reason journalist about a single big story that's really in the news. It is a great way to end the week. Please go to reason.com slash podcast and sign up for all of our shows. Thanks for listening.